Samuel Pepys made a unique contribution to our national history by his work as a naval administrator, and he donated to the college its greatest treasure, his library, a unique collection of roughly 3,000 books and manuscripts still preserved as he left it. Pepys was born in Salisbury Court off Fleet Street in London on 23rd of February 1633. His father, John, was a tailor who came from a family of good yeoman stock long settled in Cambridgeshire. Pepys' Elizabethan great-grandfather had married well and acquired the manor of Cottenham. Pepys was a boy of great talent and, after a short spell during the Civil War at the grammar school in Huntingdon, he was sent to the St Paul's School and subsequently to Magdalen College, Cambridge University in 1651. There, he was awarded a scholarship and got his degree in 1654. Perhaps he meant to become a lawyer, but witnessing the execution of King Charles I and the establishment of a republic, another career opened up for him. Ever Montagu, a distant relative, had become a council of state under Cromwellian protectorate. He took Pepys into his service as a secretary. Shortly after that, Pepys acquired a clerkship in the Exchequer. This work provided him with a little money, and he married Elizabeth St. Michael in 1655. In 1658, Pepys relocated to a house in X Yard of King Street near to the Palace of Whitehall in Westminster. It was in this house that he started to write his famous diary at the age of 27. He was 36 when fear of losing his eyesight forced him to end it. In June 1660, Pepys was appointed clerk of the Acts to the Navy Board, a key post in what was undoubtedly the most important of all government departments, the Royal Dockyards. Pepys' diary is not so much a record of events as a recreation of them. Not all the chapters are as delightful as the famous set pieces in which he describes Charles II's coronation or the Great Fire of London, but in his diary there is no entry which does not, to some degree, display the same power of summoning back to the life events it conveys. Pepys' skill lay in the close observation and full recollection of detail. It is the slight touches that achieved a significant impact. He writes swiftly in shorthand and from self alone. The words often pile on top of each other without much respect for formal grammar precisely reflect the impressions of his present moment. Yet, the most important explanation is, perhaps, that throughout the diary, Pepys writes mainly as an observer of people. It is this that makes him the most human and accessible of diarists and that gives the diary its special quality as a historical record. Instead of writing a contemplated narrative, such as would be produced by a historian or a biographer, Pepys shows us hundreds of scenes from life, civil servants in agency, MPs in debate, concerts of music and companions on a river outing. Events are jumbled together, sermons with amorous assignations, domestic disputes with national crises. The diary's contents are shaped also by another factor its geographical setting. It is a London diary with only occasional hints to the countryside. Although, as a panorama of the 17th century capital it is unrivalled, more comprehensive than even James Boswell's account of London by his London journal a century later for the reason that Pepys moved within a wider world. As luck would have it, Pepys wrote in the decade when London suffered two of its great disasters, the Plague of 1665 and the Great Fire of the following year. His descriptions of both, agonizingly vivid, achieve their effect by being something more than exceptional reporting. They are written with an empathetic mind. As always with Pepys, it is people, not literally impact, that matter. The remainder of Pepys' life, after the spring of 1669, some 34 years, is not recorded in the diary. To a certain extent, it is recorded in history. He was Secretary of the Admiralty in 1673 and in the same year became a Member of Parliament. He commanded the naval organization during the Dutch War of 1672-74 and was responsible for some imperative developments after it a shipbuilding program of unprecedented dimensions and the introduction of half pay for officers which, together with other reforms, laid the basis for a professional naval service for the first time in English history. 
Pepys was president of the Royal Society from 1684 to 86. Most of his spare time he now spent on his personal library. He intensified his search for books and prints, setting himself a target of 3,000 volumes, which resulted in Pepys and his library clerk devising a great catalogue. The work was in prospect of completion by the time that Pepys' health began to deteriorate significantly in 1700. Only a handful of books remained to be bought to complete Pepys' plan. In 1701, he moved to Clapham, where he died two years later on the 26th of May 1703, his life's work accomplished. Pepys' library survives at Magdalen College, Cambridge, to which it was bequeathed under conditions that ensure that its contents remain intact and unaltered. It is still housed in the glazed bookcases that Pepys had had made for it by dockyard joiners of the years and still arranged in the order in which he had left it. Pepys earned his place in history by his work for the Navy, but perhaps these diary volumes and the library containing them are his most powerful memorials. They speak as no other relics can of the man himself. Cheerio!